get started. So thank you everyone for being here and joining us this afternoon for our workshop on an overview of intellectual property. My name is Cameron Law and I serve as the executive director here at the Carlson Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. I'm joined by one of our team members, Arlene Miranda, who heads up our marketing and operations. She can give the, the big Zoom wave. Um, but for those of you that are just plugging into the Carlson Center for the first time, we serve as a regional hub and platform for providing approachable and accessible entrepreneurial education, community, and support to enable startup founders of all backgrounds to discover and launch their businesses. And we're on this mission to make innovation and entrepreneurship pervasive throughout the greater Sacramento region and working towards this vision of having this region be a premier hub of innovation and entrepreneurship. And so we're excited to work with entrepreneurs across what we call the entrepreneurial journey. And it's broken into three core areas of discover, build, and launch. And today's workshop is part of our discover sets of programs. So we're excited to, to have you here to learn a little bit more about IP and how you can protect yourself as an entrepreneur, as you're building your businesses, whether that be a service base or a technology that you're building. Um, for today's workshop, it's going to be led by Raphael Gassel Sinclair, who joined Sacramento State uh, to set up the Office of Innovation and Technology Transfer to, with a focus to educate and advise faculty, staff, and students about innovation and intellectual property, as well as to protect and commercialize Sacramento State's innovations and IP. Prior to joining Sac State, Rafael served 22 years in similar university offices, three years um, being the technology licensing associate with the University of Hawaii and uh, 19 years as an IP analyst officer and associate director at UC Davis. Um, he has also managed the patenting and commercializing of over 200 university innovations and has written, negotiated, and reviewed over 10,000 IP related contracts and has helped over 25 million in program income and licensing. So we're in good hands this afternoon to, to look at IP and uh, speak more about that. And so. Um, as I transition over, I'll stop my share, um, but we'd love for you to engage throughout the um, workshop here. Uh, feel free to use the raised hand feature for any questions that come in or utilizing that chat feature, which you might have already done by introducing yourself and sharing where you're from. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Rafael, who will share his screen and we'll get started with the workshop here. Well, thank you so much for, for, for having me. Uh, is anyone able to see the slide deck? You got it, we see it. Okay, thank you so much for having me here. And uh, if you do have a question, please someone let me know because I'm looking towards my left and I won't be looking down. So, so um, I geared this talk for folks who have very little knowledge of IP, okay? So uh, I'll leave a few minutes also at the end for questions. And if you have any questions that aren't answered, uh, send me an email and I, and I will answer them. My contact information will be on the last slide. Okay, So I'm going to talk about the five types of IP that are, are out there. And I've listed them here on this slide in, in order of the easiest to obtain to the hardest to obtain. So the first one we're going to talk about will be uh, trade secrets. Now, the Uniform uh, Trade Secrets Act uh, defines a trade secret as information including a formula, pattern, compilation, program, device, method, technique, or process that derives independent economic value, either actual or potential, because it's not generally known to the public, okay? And also, it is subject to being kept secret. So those are the two most important things about trade secrets. They have economic value and they should be kept secret. So some examples of trade secrets are computer algorithms, chemical products, recipes for food products, lists, devices, and uh, manufacturing methods and processes. There are a couple of trade secret laws that, that help protect trade secrets. One is the Uniform Trade Secrets Act, which was uh, of 1979, which was amended six years later. And the goal of that was to make trade secrets uniform throughout the United States. And it's been adopted by 48 states, including California. 
in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands in Washington, D.C. Okay, California has its own Uniform Trade Secrets Act, which is modeled after the Uniform Trade Secrets Act. There's also the Defend Trade Secrets Act of 19, I'm sorry, 2016. And that was enacted just uh, six years ago. But what it did it, is it tried to um, align federal law with uh, the Uniform Trade Secrets Act that the states had adopted. But a couple of things that are important about this act was it allowed trade secret owners to sue in federal court. And it also granted immunity to corporate whistleblowers. So some things to take away from this is, okay, you know, trade secrets are not registered with any government agency. They're not like a copyright that you register, okay? But trade secrets can represent the most valuable asset of a company or business entity. For example, the Coca-Cola form is extremely valuable. Uh, so one thing about trade secret owners that they have to do is they have to ensure that they maintain the secrecy of their trade secrets. The next type of IP that we're gonna talk about will be copyrights. And uh, copyright law was intended to encourage the creation of art and culture by rewarding authors and artists with six different exclusive rights. One, the right to reproduce their work in copies or in DVDs, MP3s, USBs, etc. The right to create derivative works from their original works, the right to sell, rent, lend copies of their works or DVDs, CDs, MP3s, the right to perform their works, the right to display their works, and finally, the right to transmit their sound recordings digitally. So some examples of copyrights, and I'll go uh, into them in a couple of seconds, but the main thing that you gotta remember is that copyright law protects published and unpublished original works of authorship that are fixed in a tangible medium. And I underline fixed in a tangible medium for a reason. So some examples are software, websites, videos, movies, little movies you put on YouTube, manuscripts that you write for research or a master's thesis, books, poems, photographs, architectural works, paintings. But the thing about uh, getting copyright protection, they have to be in a fixed tangible medium. For example, if you say a speech at a graduation and you haven't written it down, well, it's not protected by copyright because it's not in a fixed tangible medium. If it's recorded, then it is, okay? Also, if you're doing dances out on the street, come up with some new dances, doing some dances out on the street to make some money, um, you, you have to fix them in a tangible medium, like a movie or uh, a dance sheet in order to get copyright protection from them. Okay, so again, the copyright law protects those six exclusive rights, okay? And generally the owner of a work the creator of the work will own that work unless it's what's considered a work made for hire. And for a work made for hire, it would have to be something that's uh, done in it by an employee within her, his, or their scope of employment, or a work that's commissioned uh, for, for, for being part of a collective work, sort of like essays about different painters, that someone puts together and they pay different uh, contributors and they say in their contract that, that any work that they contribute to this collective work belongs to the person putting together the collective work, okay? So uh, uh, there are some exceptions to when you can use somebody else's uh, copyrighted work and it's specified in copyright law. And, and for example, throughout, in, in, throughout this um, talk, I've used a couple of photographs and I'm allowed to do that. I'm not infringing on the owners of those photographs because of um, the law regarding fair use. I can use them for teaching, for scholarship, for research, but also you can use uh, 
works for news reporting or commentary or criticism. So for example, if I want, if I want to, uh, to criticize uh, some rap song, I could put uh, a few lyrics from that rap song or, so, or some music from it in my criticism of it, and that's considered fair use. So uh, the law specifies what is considered uh, fair use, but the, one of the most important things is how much you use. For example, if you have a, a CD that's an hour long and you use like about a minute just to give an example of it, then that's probably fair use. And also what effect the use of that copyrighted work has on, on the market value of, uh, or on the market of the original copyrighted work. For example, me putting a picture here of an artist, uh, well, that's not gonna affect the market for sales of those photographs. So I'm gonna skip these slides, but I'm gonna leave them here for your own uh, uh, knowledge. So again, I wanna emphasize that copyright law gives protection once a work is in a fixed tangible medium. Copyright law protects the expression of the author's work. It doesn't protect the actual underlying ideas, okay? For example, if you describe an invention in a thesis, well, copyright law protects the description of that invention, but it doesn't protect you from someone taking that invention, duplicating it, and selling it. That's what you have patent law for, okay? So, Registering a copyright is not required, but there are advantages to registering a copyright, okay? So if you think your work may have commercial potential, then it's probably a good idea to register it with the Library of Congress, and it's fairly easy to do, and it's fairly inexpensive. But what's good about registering uh, a copyrightable work is that if someone infringes on that work, then you can claim statutory damages, which are usually higher than actual damages. For example, if someone makes a copy of your CD and starts selling it illegally well, for one copy, you can get thousands of dollars in compensation for, for punitive damages. And if it's willful infringement, you can get a lot more. But if you don't register it, then if someone sells your CD, maybe you'll get five or $10 from them in court because they only sold one copy. So some takeaways about copyrights is one, make sure that your work is in a fixed tangible medium. And if it's commercializable or has commercial potential, make sure you register it with the Library of Congress. And even if you don't register it, put a copyright notice at the beginning of your work. And that's that little C in the circle. And I've given you some examples of some notices that uh, you can put on a manuscript or on a poem or on a song that you write. Or even that, if you do a little video, put that at the front of the video. Okay, the next thing we're gonna talk about will be uh, trademarks. And uh, a trademark can be any symbol, word or smell or phrase or logo or color or combination of these things that identifies you or your entity or you or your entity's products or services. And trademarks enable clients to be able to distinguish your products and your services from those of others, okay? They identify you as or your entity as a source of those products or services, and it helps your you or your entity guard against counterfeiting and fraud. Plus it gives you legal protection for your brand, okay? And the thing about trademark protection, unlike, Copyright protection, which I should have mentioned was copyright protection, generally lasts for the life of the author plus 70 years. Trademark protection can last forever. So here's some examples of trademarks that you've seen out there. So a trademark could be a business name. It could be colors. For example, UPS has trademarked their Pullman Brown trucks. So if you decide to open up a delivery business, well, you can't use brown for your trucks because you'll be infringing on their trademarks. Or for example, if you start a new line of shoes, well, you can't put red soles on them because you're going to be infringing on Christian Louboutin's trademark red soles for their shoes. 
Also, domain names uh, have trademark protection. Phrases that you may hear in commercials have trademark protection, even smells. It used to be that you can go in some Verizon stores and they had a flowery must smell. So uh, if you're st selling, uh, let's see, uh, Apple phones and you try in your store you use that flowery must smell, you could be infringing on Verizon's uh, trademark. Also sounds like the roaring lion that you see after MGM movies or the duck for an Aflac commercial. Those are all trademark. So the thing about trademarks is you need to register those, okay? So you need to register trademarks and service marks with your state agency. And if you're gonna do business outside of your state, and also with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, okay? For California, you register it with the California Secretary of State. And also, I put the link here for the U.S. PTO registration, where you can register your trademark with, uh, with the U.S. PTO. So what's good about registering with the U.S. PTO is you get more protection in federal courts, and it provides enhanced protections in case of infringement disputes. So if you're just starting out with a business or with a product or with a service, uh, go ahead and either use TM if it's a product or SM if it's a service. And then after you've registered it with the USPTO, you can go ahead and put that little R in the circle. So the things to take away uh, about this uh, part of the presentation is register with your state agency register with the USPTO, notify others that you're using a trademark with the little TM or the little SM. And once it's registered with the USPTO, fully registered and they approve it, then you go ahead and uh, put the little R on there. Okay, I'm only gonna talk about this for less than a minute because I don't think it applies to to few of you out there, but there's also another type of IP uh, called plant breeder rights, plant variety rights. And what those are for is uh, you can get protection if you come up with new varieties of plants, trees, or vines. And uh, generally this protection lasts 25 to 30 years for trees or vines, 20 to 25 years for plants. And uh, I, I bring this out because you can actually make a lot of money from new varieties of plants out there. For example, uh, most varieties of strawberries sold in the US are UC Davis varieties. They're created UC Davis. And every year UC Davis receives millions of dollars in royalty revenue from the sale of their strawberry varieties. So if you come up with a new plant, you can get protection on that new variety. And, and you don't get it from the uh, uh, plant breeder rights protection from the Patent and Trademark Office. You get it from the US Department of Agriculture. But, but also, if folks who come up with new varieties of plants, they can get uh, plant variety protection from the USDA, but they could also choose to file a plant patent and get protection um, about, with, a, with, a, with a plant patent. UC Davis files plant patents on their strawberry varieties. You could also even file a utility patent for genes, traits, and methods of, the, of those uh, plant varieties, for example, you may have a plant that grows uh, like a, a new variety of rice that grows in salt water, you can get a utility patent on that. So the last thing I'm going to cover, and I'm going to spend the most time on this is uh, patents, because uh, patents are the hardest protection to obtain. And uh, they're, the, they're the most expensive protection uh, to obtain. So Patent law was designed to encourage in inventors to disclose their inventions to the world, okay? Now, Coca-Cola decided to keep their form a trade secret. Why? Because if they just file the patent application, they have to disclose it to the world. And patent protection generally only lasts 20 years. So after 20 years, anyone could use that formula. So that's why Coca-Cola has kept the secret all this time so they can, no one else can use that formula. So, but patent law is just not designed to encourage inventors to disclose their inventions to the world so the whole world can use that invention. 
But in exchange for disclosing that invention, it gives the inventors a monopoly to exclude others from making or using or selling or offering for sale that invention, okay? So um, for inventors to get copyright protection, they have to file a patent application on that invention with the US Patent and Trademark Office or with a foreign patent office, okay? Now, a patent isn't automatic. A copyright is automatic. Copyright protection is automatic. You register with the Library of Congress, you, you automatically get that extra copyright protection. But to get patent protection, your invention has to be useful, novel, and non-obvious to a person of ordinary skill in that art, okay? So I'm gonna keep emphasizing useful, novel, and non-obvious, okay? So uh, there are three types of patents out there. There's a design patent, it's a plant patent, utility patent. Now a design patent only protects the ornamental design of an object, okay? It doesn't protect its functionality. Uh, some examples of uh, things that you can get a design patent on, uh, a shape of a bottle, a cell phone, how, how it looks, fashion accessories like a purse or a hat, furniture, even a monument, okay? The Coca-Cola bottle, the Statue of Liberty uh, ha, ha, were, were awarded design patents. So there's a Coca-Cola bottle design patent and you can hover around uh, the, uh, this title here and click on it on your free time and you, you can actually see the patent. It's only two pages long. And there's the one for the Statue of Liberty, and that one's only two pages long. So the thing about design patents, again, is they only protect the ornamental appearance of an object, but they don't protect its structure or utility. They expire 14 years after you file them, okay? And you, if someone who is not the owner of that patent wants to use that design, they have to get permission from the owner of that patent to, to sell or make offer to sell to, to sell objects that, that look like that. Uh, in addition, many objects also can be protected by trademark or copyright law. For example, the Coca-Cola bottle is protected by trademark law as trade dress. So if you start selling cola out there, you can't use the Coca-Cola bottle to sell your, uh, the shape of that Coca-Cola bottle to sell, sell your, your cola because you're infringing on their trademark, okay? And Statue of Liberty also had uh, copyright protection. So even after the design patent expired, you know, you couldn't be selling uh, little statues of the Statue of Liberty unless you got permission from uh, whoever had rights to the copyright on the Statue of Liberty. Okay, there's also plant patents, and I talked a little bit about that when I was talking about plant breeder rights, but plant patents, you, you can't get them for certain kinds of plants, okay? You can't get them for potatoes, yams, or tuber propagated plants, okay? And the, the plant has to be inventor discovered in a cultivated state, and it has to be asexually reproduced, you know, without seeds. Plant variety protection you can get for plants that, that you, new varieties of plants that you can grow with seeds, but for a plant patent, you can't grow them with seeds, okay? It requires asexual reproduction. And unlike uh, plant variety rights, which last 25 to 30 years in some cases, plant patents expire in 20 years, 20 years after the filing date, okay? The last, a type of patent that I'm, I'm going to talk about is the utility patent, which is the hardest types of patents um, to get issued. Okay, so utility patents cover inventions or discoveries such as machines, processes, compositions of matter, or other improvements of those things. And they expire 20 years from the filing date, but sometimes you can get uh, a longer time for that patent. For example, if the U.S. Patent Trademark Office takes too long to examine it, you might get an extra few months or even a couple of years. So for utility patents, um, 
for you to be able to get a utility patent, in addition to having having to be valuable, useful, and non-obvious, okay, an inventor can only get one patent on one invention, okay? And when you file that patent application, all the inventors must be identified in it, okay? You, you can't in include people who aren't actual inventors, and you can't exclude people who were inventors, but maybe you didn't like them because that patent could, could be challenged and could be invalidated because you didn't list uh, the inventors and only the inventors. And it also has to be useful, have some, some utility, and it has to be eligible for patenting it, for patenting. It has to be a machine ma manufacturer or process or composition of matter. And it can't be one of the, those things that law excludes from being patented. There's a number of things that cannot be patented, okay? For example, abstract ideas like mathematical equations or scientific principles or laws of nature or natural phenomena. For example, you can't patent clone farm animals like goats, sheep, and cattle or chickens. You can't patent isolated DNA. You can't patent correlations such as a uh, correlation that a, a consequence of how a certain compound is metabolized in your body might indicate that you have a certain disease. You can't patent that. You can't patent weapons of mass destruction and you can't patent anything about humans. But the thing I underline at the bottom is you can't patent anything that has been previously dis publicly disclosed, okay? So again, for utility patents, they're designed to encourage inventors to disclose their inventions to the world in exchange for a time-limited monopoly to exclude others. Okay, and again, I'm going to emphasize that they have to be useful, novel, and non-obvious to someone who's ordinarily skilled in that art or technology. So for the utility requirement, okay, the invention can't be some frivolous or injurious to the well-being or sound morals of our society. Okay, it has to be a process, a machine, something that's manufactured or composition of matter that's useful. For the novelty requirement, it has to be different from what the patent office refers to as the prior art. Now, the prior art is the state of all information, including information of the inventors that's been made available to the public in any form, okay? It could be a movie. It could be the uh, manuscript, it could be a scientific publication, okay? That's all considered prior art. And I have dealt with patents that we were prosecuting in which the patent office used the inventor's own previous publications against that inventor to deny the patent. The patent office say, wait a second, you published this three years ago, you described this invention in this publication, we can't give you a patent on your invention. So a patent examiner can deny any application for a patent if it has been described anywhere in the prior art. Now, the prior art reference that the examiner uses, it has to be a single document that discloses the entire invention within the entire single document, okay? The, the examiner can't put together well, this invention discloses this. I'm sorry, this document discloses this. This other one discloses this and put them together and say, okay, yours is not novel. And the third thing that you have to overcome is the non-obviousness requirement, okay? So the invention can't be obvious to a person having skill in that art or technology. And the patent examiner can deny an application if the patent examiner believes it would have been obvious to come up with that invention from what's described in the prior art. And unlike determining whether something is novel or not, where the examiner has to use only one single document for determining obviousness, the examiner can use multiple documents and combine them together to determine whether or not your new invention was obvious to someone who works in that field. And for overcoming, for determining obviousness, they use, the examiners use 
uh, different tests. W one of these is uh, one of the most commonly used as a teaching suggestion motivation test. So a patent examiner will deny a patent application on the basis of it being uh, obvious or not uh, non-obvious if the invention is taught anywhere in the prior, prior art, no matter how many different documents, if the invention might be suggested in the prior art or the invention was motivated by what's in the prior art. So in order to, when you file a patent application, you can't just file a patent application on an idea like, okay, I have an idea for this new perpetual motion machine that runs forever, okay? You have to also reduce it to practice, okay? So you have to either do an actual reduction to practice where you actually make the machine, or you can do constructively in a patent application how that machine is going to be made. So you can't just patent an idea you come up with. You have to reduce it to practice. So should we file patent applications on all inventions that we come up with? Well, you need to answer some questions before you file a patent application. Okay. Will your invention benefit mankind or humankind or animal kind? Will your invention block other competitors from using your invention? Okay. That's a good good reason to file a patent application on, on a new invention if it, if it blocks other people to prevent other people from using it. Hey, do you want to get rich from this new invention? Hey, that's a good reason to file uh, a patent application on an invention. Okay. Another thing you got to answer is what is the market? potential for your invention. The vast majority of patented inventions are commercially worthless, okay? Even the majority of university patented inventions, you know, they, they never get commercialized. However, those few that do get co commercialized can bring you a lot of money or could bring your university a, a, lot, a lot of money. For example, UCLA's uh, uh, prostate cancer drug brought in over a billion dollars in royalty revenues and licensing revenues to not just to UCLA, but to the Howard Hughes uh, Medical Foundation. So uh, just a few inventions can actually be quite lucrative, okay? Also, you wanna ask, ask yourself, how much money are we gonna spend getting a patent on this invention. Generally, US patent, you can look at spending between $10,000 and $30,000 in filing fees and legal fees. And if you want to get a foreign patent, it can cost you $100,000 or more. Also, you want to ask yourself, how strong is your patent? Okay. If it's a weak patent that can be easily over overcome, or someone else can find a workaround through by doing it, coming up with another invention easily, then you might not want to get a, a patent on that. Because in 2011, there was a, a new law that came about in the US that made it faster and cheaper to challenge weak patents. And two years later, another law which made it harder to enforce patents and easier to infringe them, okay? Also, you have to ask yourself, what country should you file in? The vast majority of the patents Granted, are in just five countries, the US, China, Japan, South Korea, and also the European Union. So if you come up with an invention, uh, is it worth filing in a country such as Belize with a population of 30, I'm sorry, 300,000 people? Probably not, okay? And also which type of utility patent application do you wanna file? Okay, there's one that's called the provisional, which is only in the US. And then there's a non-provisional and a PCT, which I will talk about now. Okay, a provisional is a very inexpensive patent application, costs less than $200 to file. And what it does is it gives you a pr priority date. Priority date is the filing date of the first application. And all you can do, you do is you can have a manuscript that describes your invention, you fill out the paperwork and you send it to the patent office and pay their 
fees. I think it's $150 for a small entity. For a micro entity, it's less than $100. Micro entity is like one person. Okay. But the patent officer will not examine that. You have a year to take that manuscript and file a full blown patent application, which is called the non provisional. Now, the non provisional application contains all the necessary parts, written description, and the claims. And I'll talk a little bit about claims later that the patent officer requires in a patent application to be able to grant a patent. And the USPTO will examine that application. They will not examine the provisional, okay? But in lieu of that, you can file what's called a PCT application. And a PCT application isn't filed with the US Patent and Trademark Office. It's filed with the World Intellectual Property Organization, which will allow single application in over 153 contracting states for which the US is one of those states, okay? And what's good about that is it gives you some, uh, buys you some more time. For example, once you file a PCT application, you have 18 months to put that application in the, the patent offices of individual states. So if you filed a, a provisional, you actually got like 30 months before you decide whether or not you want to enter into an individual country because uh, what you can be doing during this, this time is marketing your invention. And you, and you see, oh, we got companies in, say, the ne Netherlands interested in uh, my invention, file a patent app application with the European Union, and uh, it'll cover the Netherlands. Or you, you see, oh, uh, Japan is really interested in my invention, you know? So then you, you file an application, you take that PCT application and file the application in uh, Japan. So in order to protect your invention and your patent rights, you have to do certain things, okay? One of the most important things is do not make a public enabling disclosure before you file a patent application, okay? Now, enabling disclosure is one in which you provide enough information that someone can make your invention and practice the invention. So if you make an enabling disclosure, no matter where or how, you're going to lose your, your right to obtain patent protection in practically every country in the world except the United States, okay? The United States has a one-year grace period. So if you make an enabling disclosure, you have one year to file a patent application in order to preserve those rights or else you will not be able to get a patent on that invention, okay? Also, don't publicly use your invention or offer to sell your invention before you file a patent application, okay? Execute contracts such as confidentiality agreements, non-disclosure agreements, material transfer agreements before you disclose the details of your invention, even to families, friends, and colleagues. Now, if it's just three of you working in the garage, then that's different. You, you guys, ladies can talk it over, work on that invention, develop it. But don't go telling your friends or family unless they've actually signed a CDA, okay? Because you could be in a restaurant talking to your friends and family about it. Guess what? That's an enabling public disclosure if you give them enough details that they can make the invention because you're out there in a public place, okay? So some examples of uh, public enabling public disclosures is publishing an article or a manuscript that describes your invention, demonstrating or presenting or discussing your invention at a trade show, a classroom, or if you're a student in a capstone course or a final scene design course, you, just, you, you make an enabling disclosure of your invention there, that is considered a public disclosure. You'll lose your worldwide rights with the exception of the US, okay? You post a description of your invention on the internet and I have seen this happen at the University of Hawaii. Someone did that and they only posted it for three days. They took it down. They lost their worldwide rights. We can only file a patent application for the US in that case, okay? Displaying a poster that describes your invention, Okay, 
defending a thesis. When you defend a thesis and you have an invention in there, that's a public disclosure. Also, when you talk with anyone about your invention, friends or family or colleagues who hasn't signed a confidentiality agreement or non-disclosure agreement or an MTA with you, then that can be considered a public disclosure, public enabling disclosure, if you provide enough information where someone can duplicate that invention and practice that invention. So make sure you protect your intellectual property rights with contracts, such as uh, NDAs, CDAs, MTAs. And what's good about these contracts is they set rights and obligations of all the parties. They set restrictions on how your IP or any proprietary research materials or other assets will be used by the, the parties. Um, sometimes these agreements, you're gonna have to negotiate them before you sign them but they're gonna give you enhanced protections in cases of dispute. So you always wanna have some type of agreement before you disclose your, your IP to anyone, except the lawyer, of course, okay? The lawyer is gonna prosecute the patent on your invention. Okay, so if you work at Sac State or you're soon here, what do you do? You develop IP here? Well, first maintain the confidentiality of that IP and then contact me here at the Office of Research and Innovation and Economic Development. And also I will have you submit an invention disclosure or copyright disclosure form. Okay, so things to take away from here are, if you're a Sac State student or faculty or staff, reach out to our office, um, use contracts to protect your IP, do not make enabling disclosures and file patent applications on IP that has strong commercial potential. If your invention does not have strong commercial protection, you probably don't wanna file a patent application because it could be a big waste of money. And also hire a patent attorney. They know how to get that patent prosecuted. They know how best to, to write that patent application. They know how best to protect you. Okay, so I'm gonna go over a few case studies here real quick to emphasize some of the things I, I touched upon, okay? Uh, first one I'm gonna talk about is the hula hoop patent, okay? Uh, now that was a very simple patent. It was only three pages long, very easy to come up with. And I'm sure you, you've seen the, these type of hula hoop things. So, I want to talk about what happened before the patent, okay? Okay, back in 1948, there was a fellow by the name of Arthur Mellon, and he and his friend Richard Kerr founded a toy company in the garage. They named it Whammo. Nine years later, they had a really big hit, the Frisbee, that plastic flying disc that you see people throwing around. That very same year that they came up with the Frisbee, uh, a lady by the name of Joan Anderson from California, actually she's originally from Australia and I believe married a service member and then moved to California with them. Well, she brought back a bamboo exercise hoop from Australia, okay? And uh, that was used by uh, like the original peoples of Australia for fun. And uh, she called it the hula hoop. And her and her husband, uh, they showed it to Spud and they made it gentleman's agreement didn't put anything in writing to share any profits from the sale of the hula hoop so spud will be sharing the profits from the sale of this hula hoop with joanne and her husband wayne okay okay so what whammo did is they obtained a trademark on the name hula hoop even though they didn't come up with it they got a trademark for it and in july of 58 they started selling the Hulu for $1.98. They sold 25 million in four months. Within a year, they filed the patent application. They started selling them in July, but they filed the patent application within the one year grace period that the US has. They filed the US patent application. And in two years, they had sold 100 million Hulu hoops. And that's a simple invention. You don't have to come up with anything difficult to make a lot of money, okay? So Spud weaseled out of the agreement and paid Joanne and Wayne nothing. They had nothing in writing, okay? 
Joanna Wayne sued Whammo. But three years later, after the legal fees and everything, they only wound up getting less than $6,000, okay? So make sure if you're going to make deals with anybody, make sure you have a written agreement, okay? Okay, so this is the hula hoop pen, only three pages long, okay? But, but I talked about make sure your patent is strong. It's a very strong patent, okay? Like if you look here, they say, Diameter is going to be 31 to 37 inches. Okay, that covers quite a bit there. Okay. And then it, it talks about the thickness of the hoop. Okay. So it's different about the bamboo hoop. This was a circular hoop, which is hollow. And also in the last claim, it talks about the diameter being 30 to 40 inches. That again is quite broad with a total weight of six to 12 ounces. So they didn't specify, it has to be 35 inches, has to be seven ounces. They gave these ranges to make their patent stronger. So make sure you have a strong patent, even if it's just an easy thing like this. If it's strong, you could, and, and it's a product with de demand, you can make quite a bit of money, okay? So let's, let's fast forward almost 60 years, okay? The patent expired back in 81, okay? Uh, back then, uh, a patent either expired after 17 years after it was issued or 20 years from the filing date, whichever was longer. Okay, patent law changed, so now it's 20 years from the filing date. So I put this little link to a 10-minute video, which tells the story of Joanne and all the stuff she went to. It's actually quite sad, you know, uh, but uh, it tells her story, so maybe you can learn from it. If you got something out there that you need to protect, make sure you do everything right, get contracts and uh, file a patent application, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, hula hoops are still selling today, by the way. Now, there are other companies who are, are selling things similar and they'll call them like exercise hoops or something else because the hula hoop name still has trademark protection. Okay, I'm gonna go over another invention. Okay. and. Uh, the term anticipated is a term used by patent examiners, used by patent attorneys. And what that means is uh, anticipated means someone else already invented something. If they mentioned it's not novel, it's out there, the prior art, you file the patent application on it, the examiner says, oh, that's already an been anticipated. It's already out there in the prior art, okay? So uh, back in 1964, there was a, a freighter in Kuwait City in the harbor carrying 5,500 sheep, okay? And it's kind of sad because it capsized and 5,000 sheep died. They didn't, they only were able to get 500 out, okay? So the dying sheep started contaminating the water in the harbor, which threatened the city's water supply because that's where the Kuwait City gets its water from, okay? So that they had to raise that freighter fast, but if they used cranes, it could have broken up the ship's hull in pieces and the dead sheep would have continued riding there for a long, long time. But there was a Danish inventor by the name of Carl Croyer. And he came up with the idea of filling this freighter with buoyant plastic balls to get it to come up. So three months later, he filled the, the freighter with 27 million polystyrene balls. They weighed 65 tons, by the way. And the freighter came up. It floated up to the top, okay? So actually, this was a brilliant idea because the company insured that freighter for $2 million. It cost $345,000 to raise that ship. So he saved the company more than a million and a half dollars, okay? So this was definitely a useful method. So car crawled Croy decided to file patent applications for this method of raising a sunken ship. Okay, so he filed with the Danish uh, Patent Trademark Office. He filed with the U United Kingdom, Great Britain, Intellectual Property Office. He filed a patent application with the German Patent Office and a fourth patent application with the Netherlands Patent Office. Back then, they didn't have the European Union, so he had to file on each of these uh, separate uh, European countries, okay? So uh, this is from the Netherlands patent application here. 
and, and this is a description of the method from the United Kingdom patent application. So there was a, an examiner at the Netherlands Patent Office, and uh, he did a thorough examination on this patent application, but he, the examiner refused to grant a patent on, it, on this method. The examiner determined that it was not novel because he found this method described in the prior art. So 15 years earlier, there was a Walt Disney 10 page comic book called The Sunken Yacht. And, and in that comic book, uh, Donald Duck with his nephews, Dewey, Hugh and Louie, use ping pong balls to raise a sunken ship from the bottom of the sea. So 15 years earlier, Donald Duck had already invented this. And, and this is the comic book that the patent examiner in the Netherlands Patent Office used to uh, deny that patent based on novelty. Well, this is just a few cartoons from the 10 page comic book. The next one I'm gonna talk about is uh, an invention by Michael Jackson. Um, he, the singer, he's no longer alive, okay? But he came up, he and uh, these uh, two other gentlemen came up with, with this invention that allowed performers to lean forward, okay? So this is the patent application for that invention. You have these special shoes, and if you look at the heel, it has like a notch, okay? And that notch would attach to like something sticking up out of the floor. And it would allow you to lean forward without falling down, okay? And that's a patent application. And these are some of the claims in that patent application. Uh, and they're all geared to allowing someone to lean forward by wearing these shoes and it changes their center, center of gravity, okay? So they can maintain that lean. We'll skip these. Okay, now, why did Michael Jackson come up with this invention? Obviously, because it was a, it would help make, make his performances, you know, really cool and make money. But why would he file a patent application on this invention? Was he going to sell these special shoes that allow you to lean? Was he going to sell stages with these notches that you can wear these shoes and then uh, you can lean forward? No. The reason Michael Jackson patented this invention is because he didn't want any other performers or anyone else for that matter to use that invention. He wanted to be the only one to be able to do this, at least during that 20 year monopoly period. And companies will do this with products. They'll patent some products that they don't want competitors to use, that they don't want other people to use, okay? So that's the reason why he, he, he patent, filed the patent application on this, okay? Uh, and the, the last one I'm gonna talk about, and I'm use this example here, is because this person, Chris, is from uh, Sacramento. Uh, uh, Christopher Johnson, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he, he's a graduate of Florin High School. He came up with this invention called the rapid uh, ramen cooker, okay? Uh, after high school, uh, instead of going to Harvard, West Point, or Sac State, he chose to go to UC Davis. And by accident, he came up with this idea of cooking ramen, cooking the perfect uh, bowl of ramen noodles okay and that was in 2002 he graduates from uc davis um his, his attorney connected him with them chico state students they developed a working prototype for this rapid ramen cooker only cost 500 dollars. 2012 10 years later from graduation to 2012 he kept this stuff a secret okay so you can get patent protection okay 2012 his attorney filed the U.S. patent application. Chris was the sole inventor on that patent application. Even though he used Chico State students to make that prototype, he was the one dir directing it. He was the one contributing intellectually to the invention. The Chico State students were just a pair of hands, so they don't qualify as inventors. So the first sales were at the UC Davis bookstore. 
And then the next sales started at the Walmart right here in Natomas. Chris just walked in there and asked the manager if he could sell his rapid ramen cooker. The manager said yes. So he sold them for about $6, even though it cost only a dollar to make. Sales started growing. He had orders to fill, but couldn't fill them. So he decides to go on Shark Tank in 2013. Okay. And I just listed all the deals that went through all the negotiating back and forth, but he wanted $300,000 for 10% equity in his business. He finally settled with Mark Cuban for $300,000 for 15% equity, uh, but $150,000 of it would be a loan. But unlike the TV show, afterwards that they, they deal, they negotiate that deal. A lot of times those, those deals don't work through, don't work out. So Chris and Mark were never able to close on that deal. But actually, this was a good thing for Chris because being on that show gave him lots of publicity. And two weeks later, every minute, 25 of these rapid ramen cookers were selling, okay? Then they started selling at Walgreens, Rayleigh's, CVS. And next year, they were like taken off. Finally, 2014, two years after the patent was filed, patent application was filed, uh, the USPTO published a patent application. When you file a patent application, about 18 months later, the USPTO will publish that patent application for all the world to see, okay? So come 2014, he started creating other products for microwaving brownies, oatmeal, or pizza, okay? 2015, finally, the US Patent Office issues the patent. 2016, he partners with Nissan Foods. Um, develops a, a top ramen brand cooker also, which is selling in stores, executes deals with Disney and Nickelodeon characters on the cooker. So uh, now 2021, he's getting $5 million in annual revenues, 55 million in lifetime revenues. And 20 years later, Rapid Brands is the fastest growing microwave cookware company in the world, okay? So he didn't do that overnight. That took 20 years, but he did everything right. He got an attorney, he kept his invention. He didn't disclose the invention before he filed a patent application. And he kept, he didn't give up. He, he didn't get give up. So here's a picture of him when he was in Shark Tank. That's him with his family, married his high school sweetheart, uh, five kids. So, uh, so he's a really good example of coming up with an idea, a simple idea, getting that idea protected with a patent and be able to commercialize that, that idea. So here is a list of resources, helpful resources, and there's my contact information. Do you have any questions out there? Any questions out there? I know we're just about at the <clears throat> one o'clock time, just for heads up. So um, for those that uh, need to pop off, um, I totally understand if you, want to stay on and ask questions, I'm happy to keep the Zoom room open for just a little bit of time, as long as that's good with you, Rafael. Oh, no, that's uh, that's perfect with me. And if they have other questions they want to send me I'll, by email, I'm more than happy to answer them by email. Perfect. Now, I can't see the chat. Should I look in the chat? Anything they're, just, in the chat? they're just sharing excellent information and beautiful story at the end. Uh, yeah, and Chris, Chris serves on the Carlson Center's advisory board, so we're excited to oh, have okay. him. I actually have his Comstocks magazine right on my desk. So, oh, all right. Uh, so, okay. So, so, uh, but no, super exciting. So Yeah, I thought it'd be good to have someone from Sacramento as an example. Yeah, definitely. Well, we'll give, give it a minute, see if there's any questions here for Raphael. What are your hours of operation? Oh, uh, eight to five, eight to five. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, eight to five. But I'm usually here late. So, so just, um, you, you can get a hold of me as late as six, seven o'clock if you call. Very good. All right, well, if there's no questions, um, we will be following up with the recording as well as uh, the slides from the presentation. So if you are wanting to um, you know, hover over some of the uh, hyperlinks that Rafael threw in there, you can access those via the uh, program. I did throw a few links. We do have some upcoming 
workshops uh, in June, one on blue ocean strategy and creating a new market, uh, designing a solution and understanding your value proposition, and then uh, corporate innovation. And then if you're a female or female identified founder, we have applications for our fourth wave program, which is a 16 week long accelerator. So feel free to check out those resources. Um, Vanessa, uh, we both are on um, LinkedIn, so feel free to connect away there. So um, we're excited to, to have that. So without further ado, thank you, Rafael, for coming in uh, virtually and speaking to IP and all things in that space. Great content, and uh, we'll be following up with the recording. So thank you all, and uh, we look forward to supporting you in your entrepreneurial journeys. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.